Hey, welcome back to Return of the King. This is our series through the book of Revelation. Uh, today, we are looking at the second part of uh, Revelation chapter 6. Uh, if you missed some of the previous ones, we'll leave a link up here so that you can check that out and know right where we are. Revelation 6, getting into the middle of that, uh, is the opening of the fifth seal. And we're going to look at that as it relates to maybe the Great Tribulation and see the parallels between this and Matthew chapter 24 uh, in particular. Uh, as we're get getting into this, just some reminders. When we're approaching the book of Revelation and the topic of ex eschatology in general, remember eschatology is a study of last things, the end times. Uh, so number one, we want to be able to discern between revelation and speculation. Revelation is what God has clearly told us about what's going to happen and the way things are. Speculation is when we try to fill in the gaps, uh, when there are things that are unclear and we're trying to figure out what they are. Uh, maybe we'll speculate about that. And if we're not careful, sometimes uh, the speculation becomes accepted as the same level of truth as revelation. And so we want to be careful about that. Now, again, when I'm talking about revelation, uh, that's little r there, not the book of revelation specifically, but revelation in general, how God has revealed that. And certainly the book of revelation is revelation, and we want to be careful about that. Uh, secondly, we want to discern between what Scripture says and what systems say. The book of Revelation in particular is one where if we're not careful, uh, we can come at it with a lot of filters. And we want to be careful that we're not reading through these filters. And what I mean by that is sometimes we, because eschatology, the book of uh, Revelation can be really confusing because of the imagery that's portrayed in there and the way that it can jump around a little bit we often will defer very quickly to what people will, will say. And oftentimes that comes from a particular viewpoint about uh, the millennium or the end times. And, and oftentimes these systems get really elaborate and built up. And if we're not careful, we're reading things and we're seeing things in there that may not necessarily be there because we're trying to make the scripture fit within our system rather than adapting our system to what scripture is actually saying. So anytime that we're studying eschatology, anytime we're studying the book of Revelation, we need to hold on to our systems, our filters very loosely and allow scripture to redefine and define what those really are, what they really should be. Uh, and always be a Berean. Uh, the Bereans were this group of Jewish people that uh, were commended in the book of Acts when Paul took uh, the gospel to them. He, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11 says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Uh, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scripture daily to see if these things were so. So the, the Bereans just didn't accept things, uh, and, and they also did not just reject things outright. Uh, Paul was obviously bringing the gospel to them, and from their Jewish background, this was new for them. Uh, they had not maybe heard these kind of things before, and they examined that against Scripture. And I can almost guarantee you uh, that most of the people watching this, listening to this, there are going to be things said in here that are maybe new to you. It's coming from a different perspective on the book of Revelation, what you might be used to. And, and what I would encourage you is try to listen all the way through um, and, and listen with the ear toward, does this really match up with scripture? Now, again, does it match up to scripture or does that match up to my system? And that's where we need to be careful. And I would say, look, if there's any points, pause, dig into the word, uh, or when you get to the end, go back and look and check that. Make sure that what I'm saying is indeed actually the truth. And again, it might be new for you, but don't let that be a turnoff right away. Uh, but let that be something that drives you deeper into scripture. Revelation should lead us more into scripture and not necessarily more into people and what they're saying, but more into Scripture and what God is saying. Um, so again, just kind of a recap of uh, some of the, the, the parallels that we have seen in Revelation chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 24. As I mentioned last time, uh, Revelation 6 seems to be just kind of this big picture snapshot of what's going to happen going forward. And it really parallels Matthew 20, uh, chapter 24. Matthew 24 is the Olivet Discourse, and this is the clearest place in the New Testament 
where Jesus speaks to what's going to happen at the end. Uh, nowhere else do we have such a detailed layout as what we do right here in really clear language. And part of the reason why we look to Matthew 24 is because one of the rules of biblical interpretation is when we have passages of Scripture that are less clear, we must always interpret them in light of, of passages of Scripture that are clear. And Matthew 24 uh, just portrays a very clear, logical, linear layout of the events that are going to take place. So you can see here, just kind of laying Revelation 6 and Matthew 24 side by side, seal one, again, just kind of with an, um, an asterisk there. I kind of think that uh, that first rider on the white horse might represent the Antichrist. And we see in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, uh, the very first thing that Jesus talks about is the coming of false Messiah, false Christ, false teachers. Uh, the second uh, rider, uh, the, the, one of the four horsemen uh, of the apocalypse, is the one that comes on the red horse the, that brings war and violence. Uh, and Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, the third rider uh, comes on a black horse. He is famine, uh, brings famine. Uh, and then Matthew 24, verse 7, the very next thing that we see, and you can look in your scripture and just see this is going sequentially through there. I'm not skipping anything. Famine is the next one. Uh, seal number four is that rider on the sickly green, the pale green horse, and that's death. Hades is riding with him. Uh, and we see, particularly in the King James, ESV, NIV, and NASB are not going to have plagues in there, pestilences. But this is probably just a carryover from Luke 21, 11, the parallel passage to Matthew 24, uh, that plagues are mentioned in there. Certainly earthquakes are mentioned there. And, you know, so death is one of those things that kind of falls out. Again, I, I would admit this is probably a little bit of a weak connection, but it's still, I think, connected in there. All of these, Jesus calls the beginning of the birth pains. This is not uh, the totality of everything. It's not the end. Uh, but he's like, take a breath. This is not it. Uh, stand firm. Then here's how the rest of chapter 6 in Matthew 24 play out. Seal number 5, we see the martyrs under the altar. Uh, we're going to look more closely at that this week. And the very next thing, right after Jesus says in verse 8 of Matthew 24, uh, that these are the beginning of the birth, birth pains, he says, then they will deliver you over to tribulation and put you to death. And so for the, the bulk of Matthew 24, uh, you can see these 19 verses. He is talking about tribulation and great tribulation in particular. And then after that, uh, we see with the opening of seal number six, and we'll look at that next time, is the cosmic disturbances, and they're identical. The sun is darkened, the moon to blood, uh, and there's earthquakes. And you see that in uh, Matthew 24, 29. The final seal, seal number seven, doesn't take place until chapter eight. Uh, but here's where we see the commencement, at least as I understand it, uh, of wrath, um, or maybe even the, the fulfillment there. And we have the, the coming of the Son of Man and the elect are gathered. So somewhere in there, and again, this is kind of loose, but it, it seems to follow the flow there. So let's uh, dig into uh, our main passage here, and that's in Revelation chapter 6 in the opening of the fifth seal, and we see the martyrs under the altar here. So if you've got a copy of God's Word, you can follow along with you, or here it is on the screen, uh, starting in verse 9. When he, the Lamb, Jesus, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then verse 11, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So here are just some things that we're going to see uh, in this moment. Number one, um, the, the Christians uh, who are killed for their witness are pictured in a couple of ways. The first is as sacrifices. You see that they're mentioned to be under the altar. Um, and this, you know, kind of uh, harkens back to Leviticus 4, 7 and a couple of other places where the instructions for the, the priest is that the, alt, uh, the, the offerings that they would bring, the sacrifices that they would bring, uh, depending on the type of the sacrifice, part of the blood would be put on the horns of the altar, part of it, uh, you know, is, is burnt, but it, it, by, primarily it's on the horns. And, um, and, and then the rest of it, you can see in bold there, he shall pour out the rest at the base of the altar. Uh, 
So the picture is that these martyrs have been an acceptable offering, an acceptable sacrifice uh, before the Lord. They had not only lived as living sacrifices, they lived as full sacrifices. And really, in our lives, we are to be uh, living sacrifices, but we're not limited to that. It may be that for the glory of God, that he may require everything of us for the sake of his name, for the sake of his glory, and it is worth it. And this is what we see throughout the book of Revelation. The second thing that we see is that they are safe. Uh, and, and this has played out a little bit more in chapter 7 when we see more martyrs uh, in that. So just the next page over, uh, that they, these are in close proximity to the throne. They're untouchable by the world. They're untouchable by the beast. Uh, they can no longer be harmed and they can no longer be subjected to death or anything. They are in the most privileged position of all. And that is right there close to the throne. They're in earshot of the throne. They are heard by the one seated on the throne. Uh, but we also see that they are aware of what is happening. I don't see in scripture any kind of indication in the New Testament of soul sleep, uh, that, that there is certainly upon death um, a, a, an a, a awakening and an awareness of the soul, and that soul is transported to one of two places uh, that we would go, uh, depending on, on, our, our, on our, the condition of our salvation, the status of our salvation. And for those that are saved, they go to uh, heaven. The intermediate heaven is probably a more accurate way to, to put that, because we know at the end of the book, there's going to be new heavens, new earth. Uh, but they are aware of what's going on, maybe not to the um, just the finite detail, but they're certainly aware of what has happened to them. And they cry out for vengeance, not revenge. They're not looking for the opportunity for they themselves to personally get even with those that kill them, but they are wanting uh, the wrong to be righted. And they're entrusting that to the one who has laid claim to revenge, to vengeance. And that is Lord God Almighty, the sovereign Lord, as they address him. Uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Um, we don't have any claim to vengeance. It's not our right, not our place. That is only uh, God's. He has laid claim to that. And so you see them uh, crying out for that and trusting God with that. What we also see, just kind of a little uh, pastoral side note here, people in heaven are not pictured as watching us. I know there are a lot of people who kind of have this idea that um, our, our deceased family members are standing on the ramparts of heaven, looking over and watching and concerned about every detail of our life. I, I don't know that that's the case because they have something far better to look at, and that's God. And, and they, they are going to be consumed. They are consumed with the greatness and the glory of God. And, and, and the other thing that we see is that people in heaven have had a significant shift in perspective and priorities. That the things that we may think are important on earth are not nearly as important in heaven. And, and, and there, that's something to just be careful about, that we're not um, just somehow um, idolizing family members to a point where they're not what they are. And so just a, 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 an insight that we have from this passage is that when we get to heaven and the people that are in heaven have a far, far greater thing to, to pay attention to than the events of planet earth. Uh, the, the next thing that we see is that they're given white robes and they're told to wait until the full number of their fellow Christians are likewise killed. Now, this is what we're going to get the, the, the peek at here in the next chapter, uh, in chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. So let's take a quick look here. Uh, it says, after, I, after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white and from where have they come? <laughs> I said to him, sir, you know, <laughs> that's a great way of saying, it. I have no idea. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Now, I want you to pay special attention to this, uh, this terminology. It's only used three times in the entire New Testament. Two times it's spoken of by Jesus. The other time is this one right here when it is mentioned by one of the 24 elders. Uh, this is going to be an important thing that we look at a little bit later on. 
Notice also that word out of. This is the Greek word ek, E-K in the English transliteration there. There are two different words uh, for out of uh, in, in the Greek. One is ek, and it means that you've been in it, and now you're out of it. So that might be like, the fireman rescued me out of the fire. And the implication of that is I was in the fire, and he took me out of the fire, and I'm safe. The other is apo. Apo means uh, like keeping away from, keeping out of, in the sense of uh, the fireman uh, kept me out of the fire, is I, I was not in the fire. I saw something of value in the fire that I wanted to go get, but he restrained me so that I could not go in. The word here is they were in the great tribulation and they've come out of the great tribulation. So these are people who have been killed during the great tribulation. And notice going back to verse nine, it's a great multitude. It's innumerable. There are a lot that have been killed in this. Uh, secondly, they're from every nation and tribe and people and language. This is Gentiles, not just Jewish believers. This is Jewish and Gentile believers. It's every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. Notice the four monikers on that. In the book of Revelation, four is kind of the completeness of the world. And this is four monikers that are mentioned about who these are, and they're innumerable, and they're clearly coming out of the great tribulation. And notice they are also in white robes, and their robes have been uh, washed and made them white uh, in the blood of the Lamb. These are Christians. These are people who have believed in Jesus, who have had their sins washed away. They've been made white and pure in the eyes of God. And, and so this is an incredible moment where we see Christians who have been killed during the Great Tribulation. This is the title that's put on that. And it's a vast number of them, uncountable number. So the first group that we see could just be representative of um, martyrs from all the different time periods, all different ages, not children, youth, and adults, but time frames like early Christian history, uh, middle Christian history, and even modern times and on up. So it could be all-inclusive, including the Great Tribulation. But the ones here in Revelation chapter 7 are clearly Christians who have been killed during the Great Tribulation. And that's an important thing to kind of tuck into our hearts and minds. There will be Christians during the Great Tribulation, and they will be killed during the Great Tribulation. And so let's uh, go a little bit further, and now let's do a comparison uh, between Matthew 24 and the fifth seal. Um, spoiler alert, uh, when you're thinking about the, the things that are going to happen in the rest of the book of Re Revelation, things are about to get worse before they get, to, uh, get better, way worse. And so let's uh, take a look at Matthew 24 and the description that we have uh, here. So again, we've been comparing Revelation 6 and Matthew uh, chapter 24. So let's look at this part. We left off uh, last time with the beginning of the birth pains. Now, verse 9, the scene uh, changes. The birth pains are over. It's getting real. Then, after the birth pains, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight might not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, 
and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Amen. So following the birth pains, what we're going to see is an increase of persecution of Christ followers. Uh, that's in verse nine. Uh, notice that then they will deliver you. That's right after that verse eight of talking about these are the beginning of the birth pains. So the immediate following uh, the birth pains is an increase of persecution of those who are truly uh, belonging to Christ. Now we need to talk about this word tribulation and we want to look at how Jesus defines tribulation because he tells us what it is right here uh, in these verses. He says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Um, so the, the Greek word that Jesus uses here is the, the common Greek word that is used of uh, tribulation throughout the New Testament, and that's the word thlipsis. Uh, say that three times real fast. Uh, the literal meaning of thlipsis means to press down or press together. It's like an intense pressure and it almost feels like there's no escape. The metaphorical meaning, which is how it's most commonly used in the New Testament, the metaphorical sense of it, means oppression, affliction, tribulation, there's that word that we get, distress and strait. So tribulation means all of these things. It's a deep distress, it's a deep pressure. Oppression is a better word for that. Affliction, it's painful. Um, it's like being in a tight space, the straits and you can't seem to find a way out. So how does Jesus define this and really uh, play that out? Number one, the object of tribulation is Christians. Note that. He says, then they will deliver you. So I know that there's a school of thought that understands the tribulation period as God's wrath against man. It's the tri God is tribulating humanity. But notice that the object of the tribulation is Christians. And the ones who are doing the tribulating, if I can coin a term there, is the world. Then they will deliver you. So the way that Jesus defines this tribulation period is more of the world tribulating uh, God's people. So the important distinction is that the tribulation period is man's wrath against man, not God's wrath against man. Very clearly in 2 Thessalonians, we are told that uh, we are not appointed under wrath, very specifically God's wrath. We are not exempt from the tribulation in the world. Uh, and, and let's look at, uh, at this distinction between tribulation and wrath. There is a general tribulation that all Christians um, may endure. Uh, this is the kind of um, tribulation that is our privilege of sharing in Christ's continuing suffering because of the world's hatred of Christ and their resistance to the gospel. So this began all the way back in Acts chapter four. This is the first recorded moment uh, of persecution against the church, of troubling uh, the church, resistance. And that's going to continue all the way to the very end. So Jesus told us in John 16, 33, kind of the last words before he goes to the cross, he says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have peace tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, we also see in Acts 14, 22, that as the apostles were preaching, uh, they were going about strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
So in that John 16, Jesus tells us, look, the world's going to hate you. It hated me first. It's going to hate you also because you look and smell like me, because you bear me in you. The world is going to sense that and recoil at you and, and try to destroy you, basically. They're not going to like that. So the ones that are belong to the world system are not going to like people who are kingdom citizens uh, because there's a different odor about us, spiritually speaking. And so because of that, that is going to be one of the, the normal things that a Christian will face in this world. But this is distinct from the great tribulation. The great tribulation that is spoken of, we heard here in Matthew 24, and also there in Revelation 7, is an intense period of persecution that will come on the final generation of Christians. So only that generation will experience this great tribulation that Jesus talks about. He says, there's never been anything like it, and no, there never will be again. Uh, so it's distinguished from the first, the general tribulation, in three ways. Number one, intensity. Uh, he said, again, for there will be great tribulation such as not been uh, from the beginning of the world until now, no, never will be. So this is a unique type of tribulation, and it's not a change in the subject and the object of the tribulation. It's simply a change in the intensity, how deep this is, how many people are affected by it. By the way, the image you see on the right of your screen there, this is the Armenian um, uh, memorial, the, the Armenian massacre memorial. Back in 1915 and 16, the Ottoman Empire, now modern-day Turkey, um, massacred one to 1.2 million Christians in a little over a one year time frame in less than two years. Death marched them through the desert, uh, forced their, uh, stripped their children away, uh, forced the children to become uh, Muslim. And it, it, it was just a horrific genocide. In fact, the, the term genocide was coined from this event uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, but what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation is going to be multitudes, an uncountable multitude. So putting this to shame, I mean, just diminishing it in the the, the scope of how many. Uh, the second uh, distinction from general tribulation and great tribulation is the immediate connection with Christ's return. So notice that after he describes the great tribulation in verse 29, he's going to say immediately after. That is a chronological, sequential time marker immediately after the tribulation of those days, the great tribulation that he's uh, been talking about. He says, the sun will, not, uh, will, will be dark and the moon will not give its light. Stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then, another sequence word, will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and the power with power and great glory. Then notice verse 31, and so going along with he's coming, you'll see, everyone will see it. He's coming with the angels, clouds of great glory. He says, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is the first and only mention of any type of rapture event in Matthew 24. And notice it comes after the great tribulation. Now, I hope, I hope, I hope I'm wrong. There's nothing in me that wants to go through something like this. But I think we need to be ready. All of Revelation is a call to being ready. It's a call to endure and to engage. It is not about escape and exceptionalism. And that's certainly what we also see in Matthew chapter 24. Um, uh, Corey Ten Boom is a Holocaust survivor. If you're not familiar with her, um, her family, when she was a little girl, they lived in Holland. And this is uh, during uh, uh, the Nazi occupation of Holland. And the Nazis were coming into Holland and, and uh, persecuting the Jewish people there, dragging them off to the concentration camps. And her father, Casper Ten Boom, uh, built a secret room. They called it the hiding place. And there's a movie out about it, highly recommended. Not great, great cinematic quality, but the story you need to know. Or if you're a reader, read the book. Uh, she wrote a, a book called The Hiding Place. Um, it was in that time that she and her sister uh, were sent to one concentrate the uh, concentration camp for the women. The men and her family were sent to a different one. 
And in the concentration camp, her sister died, uh, who she was very close to and the only other believer in that camp. Uh, and so there was a lot of loss, uh, a lot of suffering. And it was in that that she learned this reality. There is no, excuse me, no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Later, as she went around traveling and talking about this, she shares a, a moment um, of uh, talking to a, a Chinese uh, Christian church bishop there. She said, uh, in China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you will be translated, raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when tribulation comes, to stand and not fade. Uh, I, 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 I tremble because I, I hear a lot of believers who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, meaning Christians will be taken out of the world before this great tribulation period begins, or the whole seven years. I think the great tribulation is the last three and a half, as you'll see. But I think that's a dangerous place to be in. I pray for priests, uh, for pre-trib, but I need to prepare for post. Because I think when we see Jesus mention that many will fall away, I can't help but wonder if they're following away, falling away because of a disillusionment. Now, I know a lot of dispensational Christians, those who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, who are going to be unshakable if they happen to be wrong and they have to go through the great tribulation. So I'm not saying that one automatically equals the other, but if this is the limit that you know is that, you know, hey, I don't have to worry about that and Jesus is going to take me. And if he doesn't and you have to go through this, it could be a very difficult time. So all I'm saying is you may not be changing your mind right now and hearing this. It, it, it may be still kind of hitting as I've never heard this before, but let me encourage you, look closely, see, check. Like I said, be a Berean, see if what I'm saying is right and, and, and check that against scripture. Read carefully and try to read like you're reading for the first time and see what Jesus really has to say about what's going to happen. The third uh, key distinction that, that we see uh, about uh, general tribulation versus, versus the great tribulation is the presence of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be present during the great tribulation. Again, this might be one of those things that has been different than what you've heard. You may have heard that you're going to be raptured before the Antichrist comes on the scene. That's not what Scripture says. So again, you'll see in uh, verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation uh, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Daniel is speaking of a, a significant event, and he's talking about this in uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, and, and he talks about uh, what literally uh, was the first fulfillment, and I think this is a twofold fulfillment, uh, a twofold prophecy that will have a later fulfillment as well. But that first fulfillment was in Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, uh, it was uh, after Alexander the Great. He had control over uh, the, the Israel area, and he set up uh, horrible things in uh, God's temple and was a period of desolation for about three and a half years as he tormented and tortured Jews uh, on top of that. And that's, I think, a prefiguring of what the Antichrist will be doing, because this is an Antichristy type of activity. But I want you to also look, because it's most clear in 2 Thessalonians, in the first four verses. So remember, 2 Thessalonians was written about six months after 1 Thessalonians was written. And 1 Thessalonians is that famous passage in chapter 4 where Paul talks about the Lord coming and us being gathered together with him. So in that six-month time frame, the Thessalonians were getting kind of scared, some of them, that they had missed the coming of Christ. They had missed this being gathered to him. And so Paul, writing to correct that, says, now concerning, notice this, the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, 
to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he's speaking very clearly about what he talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, and he's bringing them back to that. Now, notice he's talking about those things that we see in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, don't be troubled because now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, this is that that, that restating, I'm, I'm putting that, in, or that, he's actually saying that, but that's from 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 14. It says, we ask you brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is exactly what it was saying in verse one and two. I just wanted to highlight that. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him uh, is what he was talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4. Notice verse three. Now we're getting there. Sorry. Uh, for that day, and again, the coming of the Lord and are being gathered with him will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the Antichrist. This is the abomination of desolation. Christians will be around to see the Antichrist, and he will be doing the abomination and all the other Antichristy kind of things. So that's part of the marker of what the Great Tribulation will be like. Um, and, and again, we'll see that come out in Revelation 13. Here's just a little teaser on that. And it was also allowed uh, the Antichrist to make war on the saints, on Christians, on the followers of the Lamb, uh, and to conquer them. And authority was given uh, it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So wrath is different from tribulation. Tribulation, again, is the world afflicting Christians. Wrath is the fury of God against the unbelieving world. This is known as the day of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, there are tons and tons of reference to that, and they're all really dark and scary. Uh, it's a future time of God's intense wrath on unbelievers on earth that follows the start of the Great Tribulation. So the Great Tribulation will happen before uh, the day of the Lord, the, uh, the Antichrist. So that seven-year period is not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is what happens at the end after the great tribulation has begun. Uh, so Isaiah 13, 9 is just one of those Old Testament peaks at the day of the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. We'll get more on that in next week. Um, so how does Jesus describe? So we've heard how he's defined it. Now, how does he describe the great tribulation? Uh, number one, Christians will be despised. They're going to be hated by all the nations, uh, even by family members. Um, you'll notice that I'm about to use some Holocaust imagery because I think the parallels between what happened to the Jews in World War II and what's going to happen is kind of a prefiguring of that, but it will be in amazingly, significantly horrifyingly much worse than even what the Holocaust was during World War II. Um, so we will be marked uh, and maybe perhaps identified um, uh, in the world. Uh, and it, it's going to be a, uh, not a pleasant place to be in in that sense, because we're going to be the outcast of society. We'll be the despised. Um, even now, we, we see kind of the, the the beginnings, the inklings of this. Uh, you, there are T-shirts available online. There's no hate like Christian love. Um, and I, I think that's an intentional thing that we're seeing happen in the patterns of the world uh, that are leading to this. Um, second thing that we see is that many will desert and betray the, uh, the church. Um, so this is going to be that falling away. And you see that in the wording here. And then many will fall away. I think there are a lot of people that are in the church, but they're not Christ followers. Uh, we have a lot of chaff, as uh, the, the Gospels puts it, uh, that they, they, they go to church for various reasons, and they may have a, a belief toward Christ, 
They may believe like the demon, they may have demon level belief that they believe in God, that there is a God. They may believe that Jesus did die on the cross, but that has not impacted their lives. There's not been a repentance and a true tr trust and faith in him for salvation. And when the hard times come of the great tribulation, there's going to be a, a, a mass exodus of people deserting the church and even betraying the church. So they'll turn on those within that. Look at Luke 21. This is that parallel passage um, to Matthew 24. This is the dual recording of this, um, this moment that Jesus is speaking here. Jesus says, there you will be delivered up even by parents. <laughs> that takes a lot to sell out your kids. And brothers, eh, you can kind of see that sometimes. Uh, relatives, but this is family that is selling you out to give you up to persecution and to death. And, and some, of, uh, uh, some of you, they will put to death, ascending part. Um, so some of it, they may not wait for justice, they'll just kill you. And that's, that's one of those loveless kind of things that he mentions there. The love of many will grow cold. Um, it, it'll be a time of, of deep deception even more than the Benny Hens and, and, and people like that. Notice uh, verse 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. I mean, great enough, he says, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. These are going to look so convincing that even those who are truly saved are going to kind of think that, is this the real are these legitimate? I mean, they're, they're going to be on the, the edge. I don't think they go all the way, but there's going to be that almost. They're just playing church. They're just religious. They're going to buy this hook, line, and sinker out in the world. And we see this already. And it's not even to that level yet that there are massive follow the likes of Benny Hinn and others. Uh, and, and this is just the, the charlatans, when the real false Christ and false prophets, and I'm not saying that they're, they're not, they are. We, we've been told that from the, at the time of the New Testament, there would be and there have been false uh, prophets. Uh, but when they are uh, supernaturally empowered uh, with demonic power, uh, this is going to be just ramped up to a whole new level there. So expect that. Side note, Christian listener to this, don't believe instantly everything that seems to be miraculous. Don't just hear something and say, oh, that was God. Be careful. First John tells us to test the spirits. We, we need to be discerning people or we will be deceived people. So be careful about that. Um, fourth, it's going to be deadly for the followers of Jesus. Uh, they will put you to death. He mentions this a few times there. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, we saw that um, that was an uncountable, innumerable mass of people that had come out of the great tribulation from every tribe and, and There's a of those pictures from the Armenian genocide, the Armenian Christian genocide, where the 1 to 1.2 million uh, Christians were killed in 1915 and 16. This is when they were being death marched into the desert to be killed along the way. And the time is coming, John 16, 4 says, when those who kill you, that they're doing a holy service for God. They're going to think that they're doing good. And, and this is, you know, just kind of the inklings and the beginnings maybe of this kind of process, part of pieces that are maybe being laid in place already. Um, is this idea that words are violence? Because when words are considered violence, people feel justified in responding with physical violence. Because if it's in the truly violent, the violent reaction is justified. And if you are hateful in their mind, then they are doing a service to a loving God to eliminate you. And, and so take note, uh, I, I could be, I, I think there may be something in that, but uh, again, that's that's one of those things I, I would say, this is not thus saith the Lord, this is thus, thus thinketh the Randy, uh, but just uh, take that as a, as a caution. And then the fifth, uh, it, again, it'll be during the abomination of desolation of the Antichrist. Uh, we've already talked about that. 
Um, and then we see that it'll be a period during this um, uh, time frame, and I mentioned that specifically coming back to that abomination of desolation, because Daniel seven twenty five, when it speaks of this, tells us that this will be for, as you can see at the bottom, a time, times, and half a time. Uh, that's, um, I guess, an ancient Near Eastern way of saying three and a half years. A time is a year, so like one time around the sun. Uh, times uh, is a reference to two times around the sun, and then obviously a half a time would be half a year. Uh, so in Daniel seven time or seven twenty five, it speaks of this antichrist, this little horn type figure. It says he will speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his uh, hand. They, the Christians, uh, for a time, time, and half a times. But notice it could be uh, and may likely be less than the full three and a half years. Uh, notice Matthew 24, 22. And if those days, those days of the great tribulation had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So what I think may be happening is that we'll have that great tribulation period and it will run for most of that three and a half year period, but maybe not the full three and a half year period. And then comes the day of the Lord, the wrath of the Lord. Um, the next thing is, you know, having looked at all this, you know, it may be uh, a little scary, a little intimidating. Uh, when I preached this uh, in the church on Sunday, I wanted to make sure that our kids had uh, uh, child care available because I know that some of the imagery and some of the thoughts could be, um, you know, Nightmare inducing, honestly. I mean, it's kind of scary to think about that. But here's the cool thing. All throughout this, all throughout this Matthew 24, and even in the book of Revelation, there is grace to be found. Notice this, you know, don't forget 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. Uh, it is fully sufficient, even if we have to go through the great tribulation, even if you do. Mark that deep in your heart. Because when you're looking at it from this side, you may think, I can't do that. I don't know that I could do that. And honestly, that's a, that's a thought with me. You know, I, I know some of those pressure points and pain points that could get me to the edge. And I pray, oh, Lord, you know, uh, give me the grace in whatever moment that is to be able to stand firm, to stay true to the end, and not to deny your name in any way, in word or in action, uh, but just to have that, Lord, it is a privilege I, I, you know, and sometimes, you know, Christians will say, well, what about Peter? You know, didn't he deny the Lord? Well, think about when Peter did that. Was that before or after Pentecost? Well, it was before. It was before the Holy Spirit had indwelled him. After the Holy Spirit indwelled him, there was no stopping him. There was no uh, silencing him. There was no getting him to recount. In fact, when it came to the end of his life, they said, look, we're going to crucify you just like this one that you serve. He's like, that's okay, but I'm not worthy to be crucified like he was. Turn it upside down. Turn the cross upside down. And he was crucified upside down willingly. And so I, I think while you might have those thoughts now, know that the Holy Spirit, if you are truly saved, is an active part in your life to give you the grace you need. Um, going back to Corey Ten Boom, Corey and her father were having a conversation about the possibility of him dying or others dying. And this scared little Corey. And, and so she, she expressed that to her dad. And uh, her dad said, Corey, he began gently, when you and I go to Amsterdam, when do I give you your train ticket? And Corey said very quickly, why, just before we get on the train. And Casper said, exactly. And our wise father in heaven knows when we're going to need things too. Don't run out ahead of him, Corey. When the time comes that some of us will have to die, you will look into your heart and find the strength you need just in time. So dear brother and sister, if you are you know, just seeing this and it's kind of scaring you that you might have to go through the great tribulation, know that your father who loves you deeply, who has given you the gift of the Holy Spirit, will give you the strength you need just in time. So don't miss the, the rays of grace in all of this. 
there's much grace to be found. Um, Elizabeth Elliot has made this comment. She says, there is no grace for imagination. We can imagine the worst and, and you know, we'll, ha- we'll experience fear if we let our minds run uh, amok <laughs> thinking about what could happen. And that's not where grace is going to be found. The grace is going to be found when we are actually in the situation. And so don't miss the rays of grace. Here are some of those rays that I see just in this Matthew 24 passage. Number one is the patient endurance. Uh, uh, We see in verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Scripture clearly says that many will fall away, but it sure does not say that all will fall away. And I do not think that any who truly belong to Christ will. Uh, Notice that that power of the Holy Spirit uh, it is there, Colossians 1.11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Catch some of those key words in there. Being strengthened with all power. How much power do you need to endure to the end? It's there. It's not going to fall short. It's going to be more than enough to get you all the way to the end, even if that is a very painful end at the end. And you'll see that it's for uh, endurance for all endurance, not just some of the endurance, but for all of the endurance, and that we will have the patience. And notice that last expression, even joy. It, it We look ahead at what Jesus tells us, and we may think that this is going to be something that is just going to be a dark time. But folks, I think this is going to be time of, of sweeter joy and fellowship with the Father than what you've known, because in that time, all of the idols of comfort and safety that we long for and cling to in this life, in our Western society, are going to be stripped away, and the purity of that relationship with God is going to be all that is left, and we're going to finally know the fullness of joy that we will have in that moment. I stood on the square in a, in a city in Belarus. A pastor there told me about being ripped out of his bed uh, one night when he was in the Russian army. This is during the Soviet era. And the, the, the uh, NCOs took him into the bathroom and beat him mercilessly, trying to get him to recant and turn away from Christianity. And he would not. And over and over, they just pummeled him. And by the time that the sun was beginning to rise, the the sky was being warmed by the morning sun, they finally let him go back into his room. All night long, they had beat him. And by the time he was done, his, his, his undershirt, his white undershirt was completely red with his blood. No soldier in that barracks slept that night because of the brutality. And as he stood in the square in front of an old Soviet tank, telling me this story, There was a radiant joy about his face. And he said, because God gave me the grace to keep saying, Jesus is Lord. And as he did that, many of the soldiers that had been lying in those bunks, listening to that brutality all night long, began to come to him and ask him, can you tell me more about this Jesus? And he was able to witness to soldiers that had mocked him previously And they received and turned to Christ because of what he endured with joy. And we, because of the grace that we have in the Holy Spirit, will have that kind of joy in that moment. So don't think your automatic thing, and I'm not saying there's not going to be dark and hard and hungry days and cold days and, and, and homelessness and things like that in the Great Tribulation. I'm not implying that at all. I'm just saying that you're going to know greater joy and greater grace and greater power than what you've ever known in the comfort of your home. Hmm. Second uh, ray of grace that I see is that those that are there are going to be faithfully evangelizing. We hear this, uh, verse 14, um, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Here's the amazing ray of grace that we see, is that Christians will be unstoppable they will continue to share the good news of Jesus, the very thing that is getting them in trouble with the world, their witness and their belief in Christ. That is going to be the thing that they continue to talk about and probably talk about all the more. In that parallel passage, Luke 21, 
Jesus says this, but before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake, because you're a Christian. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. God's going to open doors for the gospel through persecution. The ones who are persecuting you is going to be that opportunity to share Christ with them. And notice verse 14, he continues, settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be faithfully telling about Christ. You will be faithfully telling with power, with words that you have never thought of before that are suddenly on your tongue and coming out of your mouth, and you don't know why or where that's coming from. But that is the grace in that moment to be faithful all the way to the end, not just enduring and bearing up under it, but enduring with joy and telling about the one who has brought the joy in Jesus. And I think finally, we'll have eternal perspective to really get to see the things that are most important in life. Not to be caught up in all the trivial and the mundane and the pathetic that distracts us and occupies us and worries us and causes us to be anxious, but we will have a greater perspective on what is important in the world, on the kingdom. There's going to be a, a sharp refining of our focus in those days. Persecution has a way of purifying the church. The church seems to grow most quickly in those places where there's persecution. We see that in Iran. We see that in China. We see that in other places around the world where there has been an intense pressure, and that has only caused it to squeeze the, the fingers of the persecutors and grow bigger than what they had ever anticipated. But notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our light, <laughs> comparatively light, and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is unseen is temporary, but what is, I'm sorry, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's not the things around us that are going to last forever. It's not the money and the cars and the houses and and, and even people, it is, it is the, the, uh, the things that are far greater and, and the people in the sense of, you know, the family and friendships that we may have now, but it's the eternal relationships that we have with each other. And most importantly, that eternal relationship with God, his kingdom is the most important thing that we need to be focused on, whether we're in the great tribulation or these days of general tribulation. And so what I do see, kind of thinking back on the Revelation 7 is that when we get that glimpse of those, the multitude from every tribe and tongue and nation and the language, they are not sad, they're not bitter, and they are not despondent. They're worshiping. They're filled with joy. They sing that song, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb because he saved us. Salvation. I mean, the martyrs can say, you saved us. And they have that clear, heavenly, eternal perspective. Our problem, our fear uh, for great tribulation and so forth comes because we still have a temporal perspective not an eternal one. Our fear become, comes from, we still have idols of comfort and security and peace, and we're not relying fully on the Lord. Here's my encouragement. Kill the idols now. Put, the, put idols of security and comfort to death. Put falsehood and false beliefs behind us of thinking that God owes us a comfortable life. Nowhere are we told that. He has told us that through many tribulation, tribulations, we will enter the kingdom. And, and so I would encourage you, don't take your eyes off of the grace that we have, both now and in the days to come. So no matter if it's just today that the great tribulation is not even in our lifetime, 
But if you're, and, and we are living in the days of those general tribulation, that you stand firm, you endure, you, you lean on his grace. And folks, if you don't know Christ, turn to him. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you've got questions or comments about uh, the sermon, you can leave those in the comments below. Uh, and I would encourage you to uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to follow more uh, of, the, of this series on uh, Return of the King as we look through the book of Revelation. I am so grateful that you have stuck around to the end, and I pray that God will richly bless you. Uh, and we'll see you next time. God bless.